great. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to, uh, to speak this evening. So Linda already talked about this, GBDS. This is our research team. John Snedden there and I are, are co-supervisors of this project, and it sits within the uh, Institute for Geophysics in the Jackson Just School. Okay. okay, so I'm going to talk about these uh, giant submarine fans of the Paleocene of the Gulf of Mexico. And I think it's really, this is really, as we'll see, kind of a unique time in geologic history and gave rise to some enormous submarine fans, which are also reservoirs in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so kind of an overview of the talk today. We'll talk a little bit about the Paleocene uh, of North America, stratigraphy, climate, tectonics, drainage systems, because this is really what provides the sediment for these large submarine fans, and there are updip associated deltas. And I'll talk a little bit about the depositional systems of the, of the Wilcox group, and then a bit about the, the uh, Wilcox play itself in terms of facies, reservoir quality, drilling statistics, and provide some conclusions. There we go, okay. so. Just a bit of a stratigraphic context. So can you see, let's see. Uh, yeah, okay. So we're down here in the, the we, we divide up in the GBDS project the Cenozoic into 26 depositional sequences based on seismic data and biostratigraphy. And so the four we're gonna talk about are down here, the lower, middle, and upper Wilcox, and then the Queen City, which provides the kind of top seal and a dramatic change in depositional systems. Um, and so they're often, these rocks are often spoken of as the Paleogene or lower tertiary play by other workers. Well, you know, we're going to talk about the Wilcox because these are the, these are the groups that, we, that we, we map in our subsurface study. Um, and so, you know, we're going to talk about four <clears throat> in the Wilcox and then the Queen City. And this period spans about you know, a period of between 62 and 45 million years before present. So the Paleocene, Eocene world was dramatically different from the world we live in today. Um, this, you can see on this, this plot by Miller, it was a time of very high temperatures, no polar ice caps, and then relatively modest fluctuations in sea level because there was no polar ice to, to melt. So you can see this is a temperature plot. We're here, so something like, you know, almost 15 degrees centigrade higher temperatures than today. So probably a lot of the world would have been uninhabitable for human beings. It was also a time that was largely ice free. So you can see here, this is their, this is Miller's plot. So th these are the kind of ice house conditions of the later tertiary, you know, going into present day. Um, and uh, so, so a very different world. So probably sea level, something like 100, over 100 meters higher than present day, small fluctuations in sea level of maybe 25 or 30 degrees driven by tectonics and thermal expansion of the ocean. It's also the time of the, the PETM, uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, a time of extremely high temperatures that occurred in what's called the, in the, in the upper Wilcox. So ice-free conditions, uh, anyway, in this period from about 55 to 48 million years ago. Tectonically, it was also a time of extensive laramide uplift in the western U.S., plate convergence in, in, here in Mexico. Uh, so we're in a passive margin setting as we are today, but with extensive mountain belt to the west. Um, and this, and we'll talk a bit more about this in a bit, uh, but this led to the formation of some extremely large river systems with, with catchment areas that extended up into modern-day Idaho and maybe even British Columbia. So there's been a lot of work done on trying to understand provenance in the Wilcox group using a variety of proxies, the kind of traditional quartz felsvar lithic plots we're all familiar with, but also there's been a ton of work using detrital zircon dating to date sediments. And some really, you know, this is a really nice paper by Bloom et al. showing, using detrital zircon data that they gathered both in the river systems and looking at the updip areas to kind of parse out the different drainage systems. So there was this Paleo Rio Grande system here, this kind of pa Paleo Colorado system which extended far up, maybe as I said, even up as far north as British Columbia. And then this kind of Paleo Mississippi system that had a component of drainage coming from the, from the Laramide, but also drained the uh, central US and the, uh, and the Appalachian Mountains, which were actually, uh, at that time. 
So, so a very you know, large integrated continent scale drainage system, in some ways similar to what we have today. We know from work done by you know, our predecessors at GBDS, especially Bill Galloway, that there were several large long-lived deltaic systems, the Rockdale Delta and the Holly Springs prominently. It was also kind of a Paleo Roselia, Rosita Delta down here. And you can see, uh, so there were these two long-lived deltaic systems that were connected to this continent-scale drainage system, fluvial system. So big rivers, big deltas. So I think what's really unique about this time that there were there's also some there were also a series of very large and long-lived submarine canyons that acted as an important link between these deltaic systems and deep water. Because in a lot of ways, you'd think this would have been a time of if effective sediment trapping in the deltas. It's, you know, as anybody that's worked the geology, petroleum geology of Texas and Louisiana knows, the Wilcox is a time of, you know, of large growth faults, big deltas. So you'd think that that would be a very effective way to trap sand and prevent it from getting into deep water. So the counterbalance to that is the, the occurrence of these large uh, self, shelf incising submarine canyons. Uh, the Lavaca and the Yoakum here in Texas, and you can see here's the, the outline of the Lavaca Canyon, and this is a, uh, an ion 2D line showing the incision of the canyon here. And the canyon, you know, is over a thousand feet deep, is quite long lived. Uh, worked by Bill Galloway and his students, they started mapping this from well log data in the 80s, and you know, this work's continued using seismic data. Perhaps less well known is the St. Landry Canyon in Louisiana. It's a feature of comparable scale, not, it's not quite as well, there's not quite as much in the published literature about it. And there's also a smaller Taylor Canyon here in East Texas. But these two, St. Landry and Lavaca, were very long lived features. And they acted and they had a very important role in routing sediment to deep water. So, this is some work that I did uh, with uh, Mike Bloom. And we looked at the distance between, so this is a log scale of distance between the head of, of a submarine canyon and the shoreline. So you can see there's a kilometer, there's 10 kilometers. And what it looks like is the case, and yellow here is where we see sand being routed through modern day submarine canyons. Brown is mud primarily, and then blue indicates marls, so non-deposition. And the idea is that when the head of the submarine canyon is very close to the shoreline or river, you can move sand and gravel directly from the river, from the delta, into the canyon where it's moved by turbidity currents through, swept through the canyon. And there's you know, modern day examples like, I don't know if you've ever been to Monterey, California. I was out there sea kayaking last summer and you can literally kayak into the, into the harbor and you're, you've got like, five or six hundred feet of water under your boat because you've kayaked to the head of the submarine canyon. Uh, comes right, you know, within uh, less than a kilometer of the shoreline. So we think this is very important for sediment routing in the Wilcox. So this is work we've done. We're, we're looking at the total volume of sediment. We use core, wireline log, and seismic data to map the total sediment volume, and I, uh, excuse me for the weird scale in cubic feet, um, but uh, so this, so we're looking here, this is total sediment volume. This shows the shelf slope break here. So here are the deltas, here are the submarine fans. So this is total volume, sand and mud. I'll show you a plot in a minute of just sand volume. But you can see as we go through the lower Wilcox, we have these, you know, very large deltas. You know, they're thickened due to growth faulting but large volumes of sediment routed out into deep water. As you get into the upper Wilcox in the Eocene, we're starting to see a reduction of sedimentation in deep water. There's a global rise in sea level. We start to back flood the submarine canyons, back move the shoreline to the north and west. And by the time we get up into the Eocene Queen City formation, we've completely filled those submarine canyons with fine grained sediment and severed that connection between the deltas. And, and you also have a smaller sediment flux, but you can see we're getting virtually no clastic sediment in the basin. It's very Queen City deposits in deep water, mud and marl, no sand. So that's quite you know quite a dramatic change uh, in deposition. 
And these large volumes of primarily fine-grained sediment are responsible for driving the shelf slope break. So you can see here, you know, the kind of depositional template of the Cenozoic set up by the old Cretaceous shelf edge, which is back here in blue. And you can see there's the lower Wilcox shelf edge. By the time you get up into the Oligocene Frio, you know, the shelf has moved almost 100 miles, over 100 miles basinward due to this large volume of sediment deposited during the... Uh, during the, the Wilcox, during the Paleocene and Eocene. And then you can see, you know, as we go up into the, into the Neogene, there's a big shift in deposition to the central Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. and we push the Miocene shelf edge out in here. Uh, you know, this is that kind of Paleo-Mississippi drainage. <clears throat> now, if we look at sand grain volumes, it kind of just amplifies this story. So in the lower Wilcox, we can see the sand, there's large volumes of sand in the deltas. There's this feeder system, but we have these very large sandwich, sand-rich submarine fans. And really, you know, this is just limited by well data. We have no idea how far these go into Mexico. We know there have been discoveries in the Wilcox in Mexico, um, but really this is just the, the limits here just are data. So the, these fans may extend further south. And we have, you know, pretty good data from provenance and all that, that they have a northerly source. You can see gradually as you go up through the middle Wilcox, these systems are still active. And then gradually as we get into the upper Wilcox, we see backstepping of the system. And then by the time we get up into the Eocene Queen City, we're essentially not moving any sand anymore to deep water. And you can see the location here of Lavaca and St. Landry, the two prominent submarine canyons. It is quite striking that, you know, I was talking to Bill Galloway, that really this, this until the Pliocene, these are the, these are the two largest submarine canyons that have been mapped in the Gulf of Mexico. We really don't see big submarine canyons throughout the Oligocene and Miocene. And, uh, you know, then we start to see them again in the Pliocene with the development of Mississippi Canyon and the Central Gulf. So, you know, quite, quite unique uh, situation here. And this just kind of, this is a graph that shows sediment flux through the Cenozoic. So this is deposition rates in cubic kilometers per million years. So we, you see we have a huge spike uh, in the lower Wilcox. So as I say, very favorable environmental conditions you know, warm, moist climate, big rivers, up, laramide uplift. So very favorable conditions to create a large flux of sediment. And gradually through time, uh, we see a reduction uh, in sediment flux. You can see here's the upper Wilcox, far less than we see in the lower Wilcox. Uh, and then, you know, a drop off in the Eocene, and we start to see a resurgence in sediment flux as we go into the you know, coming out of the Frio and going into the lower Miocene. But it's still, you know, the volumes here are still, the deposition rate is still considerably lower than it was during lower Wilcox time in the Paleocene. This, the yellow line, shows the percentage of sand that is moved into deep water versus interned in the deltas. And you can see here, so, you know, we reach kind of a high in the of you know, 40 or 50 percent of the total sand volume going into deep water in the lower and, and middle Wilcox. And then by the time we drop down to the Queen City, nothing, no sand in deep water. And we stay you know, below 10 percent all the way through the Frio. And then we start to see an increase then as we get into the, into the lower Miocene. So again, a pretty interesting time here when we must have had a very efficient, not only sediment routing system, but sand routing system. So just kind of a quick, you know, summary of what we see in the, you know, the Paleogene. So it was a time of, uh, Paleocene especially, it was a time of active tectonism and basement uplift. We had these very large integrated fluvial systems that, whose catchment areas extend into modern day California, Idaho, and maybe as far as uh, Col British Columbia. Later in the Eocene, there's a shift to internal drainage, and you have these large intermontane basins and deposition of lacustrine units like the Green River. So we're intercepting the sediment at the source, which goes back to that sediment flux data I was showing you. Climate was hot and humid, greenhouse conditions, no polar ice caps, uh, with 
kind of lower amplitude sea level fluctuations. And there's really good reason, there's some really nice, Mike Bloom and I suggested this, but also a recent paper by Burton et al. that suggests that greenhouse conditions when the continental shelf was narrower, uh, you know, it's like we have really wide continental shelves now because we have these 100 meter fluctuations in sea level. If you make the fluctuations in sea, glacial, you know, the eustatic fluctuations in sea level less, you end up with much narrower continental shelves. Uh, and so Burton et al. suggested that greenhouse conditions may have been particularly favorable for the development of large submarine fans, and they have kind of a global database of where you see large deep water deposits uh, to, to, you know, to justify that. So interesting statement. Um, you know, and also, uh, so, you know, we talked about how sediment flux changes as you go into the Eocene and the Legocene. And of course, you have these very uh, long-lived shelf-penetrating canyons. So then, let's talk a little bit about deep water depositional systems in the Wilcox. And, you know, I think when, and we'll kind of talk about the history of this play, but when some of the early wells were drilled in around 2000, like the Trident well, people were kind of astonished to see thousands of feet of deep water sand, hundreds of miles from contemporaneous deltas. And so you had, you know, suggestions that, oh, the Gulf of Mexico must have, des must have dried up, right? And that's the way you could move all this sand into deep water. Uh, yeah, I don't really buy that. I think there are very large submarine fans in the world today that, are, that scale with the Wilcox. And so, you, you know, it's kind of Oakham's raise. You don't need to call on something like that. A simpler explanation is these are just very big submarine fans. Um, and so this is an example of a very big, well-studied submarine fan, the Congo fan. Uh, there's a group at the French Oceanographic Institute, Ephemera, they've done a lot of work, Southampton University in the UK as well. And you can see, I mean, there, you know, that scale, that's 100 kilometers, it's something like 700 kilometers long. It's really interesting fan because it's active nowadays. And so the Congo has a submarine canyon that cuts all the way across the shelf into the mouth of the Congo River. And current monitors have been placed in this canyon, and we know that there are turbidity currents that last for over a week and transport cubic kilometers of sediment. I mean, this has been mapped, you know, happening in the last few years. And we know from dating sediments on the distal end of the fan here that they were deposited in historic times. So there's a, 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 a isotope of cesnium that's related to the atomic bomb, atmospheric atomic bomb blasts in the 1960s. And you see that cesnium isotope in, in the deposits out here. So they were deposited after, the, and I've seen cores here, it's very coarse grain sand, 700 kilometers from land. So what this system looks like is you have a whole series of levied channels feeding these depositional lobes, shown here in yellow, and through time, as these channels have evolved, they've built up this architecture of sandwich levees, which can be sandwich lobes and channel fill deposits in the sand. And you can see these things can be, you know, 100 kilometers or so, you know, across. So, you know, a very large system. And this whole fan, you know, it's like a couple of kilometers deep, was thick, was deposited in the last 80, 80, 800,000 years. So, you know, as I said, there's this kind of, you know, people, you know, compiled data on submarine fans and related it to the, the kind of scale of river systems. And, you know, sort of a classic paper by Soam et al. where they said, you know, it's pretty kind of obvious in a way, but they were able to document it. If you have a very small river, especially in a tectonically active basin where the shelf is narrow, drainages are small, you end up with small, maybe sand-rich submarine fans. And as, you know, you develop a, you know, kind of lower gradient system, you know, that's much, where the river system is much longer, that's the scale of the river system, you end up with longer submarine fans. You have a bigger area to catch sediment, and you can build a bigger submarine fan. So, you know, this is a paper by Bloom et al. that, you know, kind of show the scale, the length of, the, of a submarine fan, maybe like half the length of the drainage basin. So, again, good reasons why we'd have very large submarine fans uh, in the Paleocene. So this is a, a dip-oriented log profile of, of wells in the, uh, in, the, in the lower tertiary. So it's, it's datumed 
on the, queen, the top of the Queen City, which is shown in blue, because it's mostly carbonates. So you can see clastics, the blue down here, this is a Navarro Taylor, so the Cretaceous. So there's the KT boundary. Uh, 1,000 feet for scale. So, you know, five or 6,000 feet of, in many cases, in the more distal reaches, 50% net to grow. So very sand-rich systems. As you go up depositional dip, you can see the sands are less well uh, amalgamated. A lot more mud in between sands. You can see in the kind of distal reaches, you know, thick amalgamated sands with some through going mudstones. Um, and so we interpret a lot of this to be channel levee deposits up dip, sand in the channels and a lot of these mudstones being the levees. Uh, if you look at some of this stuff in core, you would see a lot of these finer grained, more heterolithic deposits or, you know, finely interbedded sand and rip, uh, you know, ripple laminated fine sand with mud, which is very common facies in levees, along with these kind of more blocky uh, sands, which are probably distributary channel lobes, we would interpret them. But you do see it's very interesting up dip to down dip change in the percentage of sand and the degree of bed amalgamation with more poorly amalgamated lower nut to gross section up dip and more amalgamated, more sandy system down dip. And this is a strike profile. You can see as you go in the east, I mean the Wilcox is very thin. Uh, uh, just a few hundred feet thick and eventually if, as you go further east into like Florida waters it becomes just marl. Uh, as you go westward it becomes very thick and, and this I didn't have, you know we haven't had time to like fully work this well up. This is the Shell AC691 Leopard Well, it's just released a few months ago and uh, it's over, there's over 8,000 feet of Paleocene deep water sand in this well. I mean, it's just staggering the amount of sand. It looks like it's, you know, it's, it's an inverted basin. I mean, it's, it's very thick. Salt was obviously being deformed to generate such a great thickness of sediment, and now it's sitting on a structural high. Uh, it was a discovery. And so we, you know, we did some work on deposition rates. And you can see, I mean, you know, we get deposition rates uh, in the Wilcox, of, you know, hate to, you know, like 500 feet per thousand years. I mean, it's a very high rate of deposition. Probably, you know, it's always seems right punctuated, right? Like very fast deposition when that lobe of the fan was active, <coughs> and then probably a hiatus. So you'll probably see a whole series of periods of very rapid deposition rates. You know, a single bed, maybe several meters thick, deposited in a week, and then long hiatus between those. So, um, so anyway, I mean, it's quite a, you know, quite a dramatic uh, accumulation of sediment, of deep water sediment. So, you know, we would, I would see a, you know, a depositional model like this where you have these very well amalgamated lower Wilcox fans. So you go this way, they, they kind of grade into marls. And there must have been, you know, we assume, we, we know they've got these up-dip canyons. So there must have been some sort of channel levy network that connected through, so this would have been the deposition, this is the shelf slope break, this would be the slope, imagine, you know, very mud rich, dipping at something like two degrees into the basin. Some sort of ab abyssal plain out here, we're probably, as we deposit sediment here, we're starting to see salt deformation, so there are probably mini basins, just, I mean, stuff is so deep and poorly imaged, it's hard to, you know, you know understand. So this is really, I mean, very, uh, if you will, you know, interpretive. But we know from like our depositional model of the Congo fan that this is, you know, this is the way a lot of submarine fans work. You have large channel levee systems that maybe, maybe feed smaller lobes out here and eventually, you know, they, they built out and we see these very amalgamated sands out here uh, in deep water. And I, I think, you know, for many of us, you know, who worked the Gulf of Mexico back in the, say the 90s or the 80s, you know, there was this feeling that, you know, clearly, you know, there were these big sand rich deltas and like, where'd all the sand go? I mean, and you know, there were bosses that would say, well, there's no sand in more than a thousand feet of water, right? Because, you know, they were drilling in the Miocene or whatever, these kind of up dip feeder channels, which were quite muddy. And the big surprise was, of course, there's this large sandy fan that's down dip of that. So what does the Wilcox group look like in terms of reservoir quality and facies? So this is, 
There's a, some, a core photo of, of a Wilcox well, uh, kind of go into a bit more detail. So, so I mean, this, the Wilcox is really dramatically different in terms of lithophases and grain size from the Miocene. It's uniformly lower fine to very fine grain size, often poorly sorted with a high silt content. Uh, the somewhat better permeability sands are somewhat better sorted. The deltaic facies do have some medium-sized sand, though we've never seen anything coarser than medium sand. It's also, compared to the, the uh, Miocene, which is a quartz aronite, so I'd plot up here, uh, the Wilcox is, is, you know, the Paleocene, is, you know, enriched in feldspar and lithics, as you'd expect since it's, you know, draining the Laramide source areas where basement rocks are being uplifted. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's got quite a, a wide range of, you know, feldspar and lithics. Um, it's also in many places quite thinly bedded. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about here in a minute, along with baumatite turbidite <laughs> deposits, there's a significant component of muddy sandstone called hybrid uh, event beds or slurry deposits. And these also have a big impact on reservoir quality. So just, you know, word about these features. So, you know, here's your typical turbidite comes ripping down here, has got a big cloud of sediment, turbulence lofts the, the silt and the clay up and separates it from the sand which moves along the bottom here, maybe is traction or maybe lower in the flow. And so you end up with a very well sorted high porosity permeability rock. Hybrid event beds operate a little differently. So there's, you still derive from a turbidity current, but as the flow starts to decelerate in the basin, Instead of this process continuing to go on, it, it sort of catastrophically stops and collapses. And you end up with these beds of muddy sandstone that have much poorer uh, rock properties. And so we'll see these packages in the Wilcox and other units like this. We will have a well-sorted, kind of more typical Bauma AB. And then you'll end up with this muddy sandstone that might have a lot of rip-up class, a lot of plant material. It's still predominantly sand, but it's got a lot of interstitial mud, organic material, rip-up class. So, you know, you'll see if you look at uh, UV photos, this will fluoresce and this won't. So that's one issue. So if we look at reservoir quality, and these are data that were released by the BOAM, uh, garden, from some wells and, and garden banks, Keith the Canyon, Walker Ridge, and I think the thing to see is that, I mean, you know, typical log scale of permeability, so it, uh, corrected for burial porosity. You can see, I mean, while you do have some good, you know, 25% porosity, you know, hundreds of millidarcies rock, in general, a lot of the sediment is in here. So in the tens to single digits, and this is largely a function of the, you know, relatively poor grain size and sorting. Um, so, you know, we have this grain size, very fine sand, coarse silt, can affect the porosity and permeability. There's also, a lot of these rocks have undergone significant compaction and quartz, cement, quartz and calcite cementation. So, some of this really low porosity stuff, these are in sandstones, but they're pervasively calcite cemented. And so we can, as a result, this low porosity and permeability results in very long transition zones above the oil water contact and zones of high water saturation due to low porosity and permeability even above the oil water contact. So, I mean, this, you know, uh, play has had a kind of long storied history. The early wells were drilled in Alaminas Canyon. So there was a well, a Baja well here that was drilled in the 90s, it was the, or 80s. First well to, to drill the section, drilled all the way into the Cretaceous, encountered some, uh, Paleocene sands. But the real kind of like significant, you know, uh, and I've just got to make sure I get this right. Uh, there was a well drilled in here by Unical, uh, oh, darn it, the, the Trident well, drilled right about there, that encountered a very thick Wilcox section, was drilled in 2000. And that really got people interested in this play. This was a, you know, well, it ended up being a, like a sub commercial oil discovery. And as you can see, in the last 20 years, there's been a large number, something like, I, you know, we have to rely, rely on public release data, but this is similar numbers to what the BOAM reports, something like 77 exploration wells. If you include, 
There was a deep shelf gas play that was <coughs> drilled in the like 2000, 2010. So wells like Lynham Creek, Will Kay, Davy Jones, they all had at least secondary targets in the Wilcox, and none of them found you know commercial hydrocarbons. So you know that part of the play didn't work. The success has been in these, this kind of more outboard part of the play. You can see there are very few wells. You know this whole you know part of the play that connects the outboard part with these scattered wells on the modern day shelf. I mean, it gets very deep here, though there is increasing interest in pushing the play further to the northwest. So we kind of, you know, see this like deep shelf play, an inner fold belt, an outer fold belt, and then the Perdido. Oh, if I might go back to one thing. This, it does extend into Mexico. So these are a number of, Tryon is a field that's being developed by BHP Woodside currently with uh, Petrobras. Uh, so it, you know, and it's, I mean, there's limited data that have been released, but it looks very sand rich, much like some of the wells in the Shell Perdido play. So, I mean, this play definitely extends, you know, further south. Some of these other wells in Mexico have failed allegedly for lack of reservoir, uh, for lack of charge. But we don't really have access to a lot of data from them. So, you know, a number of different plays. I think one thing that really stands out is, uh, there's quite a wide range of burial depths. So you can see here, I mean, you know, some of these inner fold belt wells are as much as 27,000 feet below the mud line. So very deeply buried. A lot of them are around salt, so that helps, you know, mitigate the thermal effects of burial, but still, you know, compaction's an issue, and as I said, burial digenesis. But as you go into the Perdido fold belt, wells are only two to like seven or eight thousand feet below the mud line, much shallower, much less compaction and burial diagenesis. They're also much better image. I mean, Shell's published some spectacular images of channels and lobes and levees uh, from, for these. Uh, so, uh, and they, you know, allegedly have dramatically better reservoir quality. So, you know, this play has been, in many ways, remarkably successful for a non-DHI, direct hydrocarbon indicator play. Uh, so, you know, according to our analysis, which is similar to BOE's, you know, about 40% of the wells are dry holes. It's kind of hard to tell, you know, we don't really know what the company's cutoffs, we don't have, you know, very advanced logs, but I think that's, that's a good number, and BOEM comes up with a similar one. 77 tests. Um, about maybe a third of them are, appear now to be non-commercial discoveries, so they logged hydrocarbons, but there's been no development plan. There's some we don't know, and then about 20 per 17 percent are producing or have development plans. So recently, uh, Shell announced the North Platte discovery made by Cobalt that they'll develop it, and Chevron's going ahead with Anchor, and these are significant because there are over 20,000 PSI reservoirs. There have been a number of discoveries made in this play in this kind of very high pressure end of things. There wasn't the drilling and completions technology to monetize them, and so, you know, maybe some of these, you know, will end up being moved into that category. There's also been kind of an effort of smaller companies like Log and Beacon to take over, you know, fields discovered by uh, Chevron, uh, BP, I believe, and, you know, and develop them. So, you know, it's been kind of the majors who are working on the very large fields, and then some of their smaller discoveries have been picked up by smaller companies. So, I mean, these things are all kind of in flux on this side, what's, you know, what's commercial and what's not. So, you know, play elements, uh, as we said, at least the submarine fan part of the play, very, uh, uh, very low reservoir presence risk. It looks like, there was one well we could find, it looked like it had a very thin Wilcox reservoir that may have failed due to lack of reservoir. Uh, there seems to be a low top seal risk. Very thick, extensive shales and marls in the Eocene. Uh, and there's certainly uh, columns over 1,000 feet. So a very thick top seal that cannot easily be breached by faulting. It's perhaps thought that maybe charge, charge and trap timing or fetch area may account for some of the failures. Uh, probably not, you know, things like fault seal because you have such a thick overlying section. Source, error, source risk is probably low due to the ubiquity of the Tithonian source rocks in this part of the Gulf. 
Reservoir effectiveness is a major issue. It looks like there's a decrease in net to growth as we go up to the more channel levy dominated part of the system, like around North Platte and North. And there could have lateral effects on connectivity in this as you go to deeper burial compaction and diagenesis become more serious, could have a more serious impact on reservoir quality. There's also very, la within fields, there's laterally continuous shales. And certainly, uh, looking at pressure data, there's m these, even the successful fields have multiple oil water contacts, multiple pressure compartments. Haven't really seen any coarser grain like traction deposits going up dip. Um, so, so uh, in conclusion, Paleocene was a uniquely favorable time for submarine fan development in the GOM and, and maybe globally. It's quite a different play from the Miocene play. Uh, you know, ice house versus greenhouse conditions, much larger fans in the Paleocene, much poorer reservoir quality. Very large volumes have been discovered, but there's unique kind of drilling and completion challenges that have made it difficult to commercialize many of them. So, thanks. We certainly open to questions. Has anybody got a question? Yep. A real good talk. I, I enjoyed it. I have a lot of experience in the Yoakum and Wallaca Channel oh, right. areas. I've uh, mapped those areas extensively over a lot of years. <clears throat> And one thing I noticed is that I know the Yoakum Channel in particular originated in the middle Wilcox. Right. Uh, it eroded down to the lower Wilcox. Uh, and it, uh, the middle Wilcox, where it is, is largely shales. Right. The uh, lower Wilcox, or where the uh, 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 sand uh, delta deposits are. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if it, if, if Lower, if the source of the sediment is lower Wilcox, uh, and this might be a minor issue, but if, 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 if it's eroded and relocated in the middle Wilcox, wouldn't a lot of those sands up in uh, deeper Gulf actually be a middle Wilcox age deposition from lower Wilcox source rocks? Yeah, I, I can see there might be some component of reworking, but the, the, the very large volume of sediment, if you just look at the amount of, you know, most submarine canyons are largely filled with mud. You know, there are sands, you know, I've seen some of them in core, but I think the sand volume, you know, there, there might be a component of that, but I think it'd be really small. I think the deltas are very big, and there seems to be, even in the middle of Wilcox, quite a large sediment flux coming into the basin. So I would think, you know, a lot of it's, you know, the middle Wilcox fans, it's middle Wilcox age, you know, it's the sediment coming down at that time from the rivers into the deltas and canyons, Predo predominantly. Hmm? Anyway, um, quick question, so this may just, uh, just a comment on the, you know, you should one dive, the a question I've always had around this is, what is the slope of the slope? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. during Paleocene time, going from Cretaceous because you've got this big salt right. pillow, right? And then the diagrams, you know, you kind of show it was a very short, very steep slope. Yeah. And well, the other one, but the, but the maps kind of look like long run out, you know? Right. So it just, uh, you just comment on that, how you guys are working through that. Well, I mean, you know, even the way that was drawn, even there, the slope was probably like two degrees, right? Uh, the slope of the continental slope. I mean, that's pretty average for passive margins, so it's not real steep. Um, it's a good question. I've talked to Mike Hudek about it, and, and you know, we're really challenged by like si the kind of data we have to see it, right? So how, were there many basins, right? It looks like from this leopard well, yes. And so that drawing doesn't really reflect that. So there may have been, you know, as you loaded all this volume of sediment on the Luan, it undoubtedly deformed. But trying to, you know, reconstruct, you know, Wilcox, you know, I mean, it's, oh, it's pretty, that's a pretty well, thorny yeah, topic, right? Data about every all the way yeah, right. Wow. Well, of course, it's all been remobilized then, right? right. So, yeah. So, yes, I think conceptually that probably has to be true. Now, how I would, you know, draw it on a map. Because one of these is interesting, right? If you're going to go up dip, right? Yeah. With regard to going back to the Congo fan, right? On those, um, you know, distributary channels right. that go off of the main canyon, right. right? There's these ponded, right. yes. you know, Fans, I guess, yeah. basically, yeah. smaller scale. But I mean, on a, from an exploration standpoint, they would be 
one, they're up tips, they probably have better reservoir quality. Right. right? And then two, um, they're going to be certainly big enough to trap a, a significant amount of hydrocarbons. I mean, I think, sure, there's a play in that. The prob I think the problem is going to be pr res prediction, right? Because, you know, you can play something like that in Angola where you've got great seismic and you've got direct hydrocarbon indications, right? Now, how do you play at subsol 20,000 feet below the mud line where, you know, you're not, you're not going to be able to see it, right? right. That's going to be the challenge, I think. But that's, that's the new, new node technology. Hopefully it's going to change that. Yeah I, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I mean, people, people are exploring that play. I mean, so, you know, maybe they, they have probably better seismic than we've ever seen, than I've ever seen. Okay, so who else has a question? Uh, the kind of person over here. It's Martin Cassidy. In the uh, South Texas, many of the sands have volcanic rocks in them, little pieces of volcanic rock, uh, which have, uh, were uh, uh, glasses and now are zeolites. <laughs> Uh, and result in strange porosity for plugging. Uh, do you see any of the result of that in uh, the sediments in the, the deep gulf? So we don't have a lot of data uh, that's publicly available, right? So I mean, that's a problem. You certainly see that in the Frio, in the Oligocene. You see a lot of volcanic rock fragments. Uh, I have a student who's working on compiling a database of uh, paleogene, you know, Paleogene uh, quartz feldspar lithic data. And we've really struggled getting things in deep water. We're trying to get some of our member companies to like give us some data. So I, I mean, my feelings, I know that's certainly true in the Oligocene and the Frio. And I don't, I haven't seen enough data to know for sure how true it is in the, in the Wilcox. In Mexico, you see dramatically, we do have some data in Mexico, and it's dramatically more feldspar and lithic rich in Mexico in the Wilcox than it is in the northern Gulf. It's more of a litharonite. Okay. Yeah, and you know it's possible as you know that there were smaller lobes, uh, smaller lobes inboard. If there, you know, if you did have mini basins, but it looks like just from the date, you know, the well data, and you know, when I was working, we had some like really some really nice two D lines out in front of the salt, and you could see this kind of massive compensational stacking over tens of miles, which you know suggests a you know, a really big fan, well amalgamated fan. That was near the U.S.-Mexico border where you're out in front of the salt. So uh, I think that the really big amalgamated fan is where I drew it and there might be smaller uh, fans, in, you know, as pointed out, in mini basins up dip, but there's so little well data, it's, you know, be very conjectural. But you wouldn't have expected uh, those amalgamated thick lows to be at the, up to the base of slope. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, well, I mean, if you look at places, even like the Congo, I mean, the main locus of deposition is further out. In the, it's not like it sort of marches out. I mean, the, what happens is the levee channels extend, and they can extend quite fast. And uh, so I, I mean, at least, you know, my interpretation is that, it, you know, and based on the well data and limited 2D seismic, that it looks like the main, uh, the best developed, most amalgamated part of the fan is further basinward than what to me. Base of slope. There's a couple. Oh, Janet, I guess. <laughs> okay, whoever. Hi, just to find so Um So I keep seeing, well, we keep seeing a lot of companies putting a lot of bids on areas, probably for the low cops where. Um, we're not seeing very high perm at all, and when we map it out, it doesn't look economic, um, marginal at best. <laughs> do 
Do you have any comments on what they might be doing? Is, it, do you, is there rumors of new technology coming out? Because so far we're construction iron. I, I have, yeah, I have no idea. You know, I mean, this is no secret that the only way to make this stuff work is to do stacked fracks, and those things. I mean, it's published that you know they go. It's like three hundred million dollars a completion, right? So, boy, you better have a really thick column, and uh, you know, to to make that fly. So I don't, and that's with the more conventional stuff that's outboard. I can't imagine if you you know you're in the sub millidar sea. Yeah, I, I'm, but I'm not. A, I'm not a completions engineer or an economist, so it doesn't. So a few people ask me to ask you. Yes, I don't understand. Yeah, like, but hey, it's not my money. <laughs> No, no, I didn't. I didn't talk about. The, I know Vicksburg's one of your, your you know, your fate. <laughs> but we we've done some mapping on the Vicksburg, and it doesn't look like any of those Eocene units have, you know, any significant amount of sand. The only thing in the in the Perdido, the Oligocene, there's there are deep water Oligocene reservoirs, and according to you know hearsay, they're quite coarse grained, uh, but. Uh, you know, there's not really much published on them. Uh, so there does seem to be a very localized Oligocene submarine fan in the Perdido area. The, otherwise, the Oligocene throughout the Gulf of Mexico in deep water is marl. Uh, so... Yeah, that's kind of what I remember, Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. I heard Yes. Yeah, not, you know, we've looked at a lot of, we have access to a lot of the wells and we've yet to see that. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, years later, right? Hey, Mike, uh, great talk. Uh, I have two questions specifically related to the Tyler Martin County uh, uh -huh. canyon system. Um, so it's not as broad nor as deep as the right. Yoakum Channel system, right. but there are onshore penetrations that show it's over 700 feet thick. Yeah. Um, so my question is, well, first of all, have you been able to assess kind of what kind of contribution that channel system had to the overall depositional system? And is the reason for not talking about it much is that you just don't have enough data to support explaining it? Right. That's exactly right. So what we'd really like to do, and, you know, like I worked, you know, I worked for Exxon and, you know, they're big, you know, so there's a lot of data that companies have about provenance on these wells. And uh, that would really help us crack these kind of questions, right? But we just don't have access to enough of it to really be able to tell the difference of the contribution of these three submarine canyon systems. I, you know, we're, we're trying to get more data, but it's only, we can only have access to what's publicly available. So we, yeah, we're limited. <laughs> 